Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Kathleen Berry. Thank you very much uh, for joining me, uh, Kathleen. Oh, I'm glad to be here, Edwin. So uh, I've actually done an interview with you uh, before, and I have also videotaped uh, you talking about your book, uh, Unmaking War, Remaking Men, How Empathy Can Reshape Our Politics, Our Soldiers, and Ourselves. And in this uh, video, what we wanted to do was actually go through uh, sort of a teaser to a workshop that you're going to be holding based on your book. And you're doing right. like a couple day workshop uh, based on, on the, you know, what you've uh, kind of researched and, and put into your book. And so we want to co kind of go step by step uh, through that, uh, do that uh, outline. Great. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing this workshop. It's going to be at Casa de la Maria in Santa Barbara. Uh, Ju July 20th to the 24th um, and starts on a Friday evening, goes through Sunday. And it's it, the title of it is Empathy and Consciousness Raising uh, for Unmaking War, Remaking Men. And so that's pretty much what we're, what we're trying to launch now. Yeah, so you're going to be doing a whole series of these workshops, I believe. Is that the, the idea? Well, this one workshop is scheduled. Um, and assuming that, that things go the way we hope they'll go, I'm really hoping to be able to do this in a lot of other places. Because one of the points of the workshop is to really address this problem of Americans seemingly being tired of war, which suggests a kind of disconnect on the part of American people from what our country is doing to other people in the world, not to mention our own American soldiers. And it, it's that connection that has to be made again in order to really fulfill our responsibility to dissent against the war crimes and crimes against humanity that are going on in our name, supposedly for our protection. So what we wanted to do also was, is you'll be uh, going through this outline of your, of your workshop, mm -hmm. and then I'll just periodically kind of, uh, kind of respond or kind of reflect back what I'm hearing. Uh, you say it was okay. kind of like the outline. So, you know, it's take it away. Just uh... thanks. That's that's a great opportunity. And I really appreciate being here with you, Edwin. You're both really very uh, generous and so very much committed to empathy that it's it's really a privilege to be talking with you about this. My concern from from the book that I've written is really focused on um, the horrors of war, not in the sense that we have to walk through those horrors again, but in the sense that we have to stop them. And so we find out a few weeks ago about the president's kill list. We find out uh, today and yesterday that the president is now admitting to um, what, what's tantamount to war in Yemen and Somalia at the same time as we're at war in Pakistan. None of these countries has the U.S. committed war, you know, agreed to commit war against. Um, and so the president frames it as if he's doing it in conjunction with those countries. Those countries really want us out of their, um, out of their way. Um, and meanwhile, we have the Afghan war going on. And the residue and remnants of what was done in, in, by the U.S. in Iraq and the enormous loss of human life there. So, and then, of course, 
there's always a war in waiting for because we're in this kind of situation of ongoing war so there's always a war in waiting and that would be you know the the push for a uh, going to war against Iran there's a lot of ways to talk about all of this horror these crimes war crimes and crimes against humanity I want to talk about them in this workshop in relationship to empathy because I, I really think that what has happened to us has been a manipulation by the media, by the government, by the military to get us to kind of believe in American exceptionalism and, and that that means that we have the right and the responsibility to be doing this killing in other countries. Uh, and my view is, and I know it's part of the whole worldwide work on empathy right now, is that until people can feel what other people are going through, people living in war zones, people fighting in war zones, until we as Americans can feel what that's like, we're going to stay distanced, we're going to stay disconnected, and we're not going to meet our moral responsibility to stand up to these crimes. So the workshop is designed around empathy in that sense. So you're, you're saying that we're kind of in this perpetual state of war, per, 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 uh, per, per ongoing kind of fear and anxiety. We all always have to be kind of on guard. And through that process that the empathy is kind of like tamped down instead of being empathic to all these and fostering empathy with these different societies, we're kind of in this constant state of, of fear maybe and anxiety and, and war footing. And you're wanting to uh, kind of promote empathy as a, maybe like an alternative, kind of like? A empathy is a way to get into really um, voicing our dissent and, and believing, coming back to believing that change can happen, that we can make change, we can make a difference. And I think that, I mean, what I know about empathy is that in addition to being the way one thinks, the way one feels, it is a way of action. It's, a, it's, it's something that we do. When you see someone hurt, you rush to try to comfort them or to help them. It's a, a kind of an automatic response of human beings. That's something that you do. Empathy engages us in wanting to do, so, do things to change that which is harmful. And while you were speaking, I was thinking, actually, we're, in this workshop, we're going to be focusing also on restoring self-empathy. If Americans had empathy for themselves, there's a lot of things we would not tolerate. We would not tolerate our banks being buoyed up at the expense of people who are being thrown out on the street and homeless because of foreclosures. Um, the, the kinds of things that different movements have tried to address. There's something strange going on in this country where we're hiding for protection to move away from really seeing how if we had empathy for our own selves, for our immediate family, we couldn't tolerate being treated the way we are in this economy in, in this time. If then I can't stand to be treated this way, it goes without saying that I can't stand to see someone else being harmed and abused by my country by the military of my country, by the president of my country. And that's how I connect empathy into this. Mm. So there's kind of this empathic action component that actually taking action to alleviate uh, people's suffering or to contribute to their well-being. And then it's not like you were saying, it kind of starts with self-empathy, you know, perhaps empathy for what's going on uh, within us and then 
uh, for those in our immediate uh, families and communities. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really what we want to get at. I have a lot of different ways of developing um, action around this in this workshop. It's going to be a very experiential workshop. And I don't mean experiential in the sense of dragging people through the gore and ugliness of combat. That's what the news does. For example, the news reporting on Syria right now is there's times when I have to close my eyes. It's so, so gory. That does nothing to raise our consciousness. In fact, what it does is turn us off. And then I hear my friends saying to me, oh, I've stopped reading the newspapers. I've stopped watching the news. I don't know what's going on. I don't want to know. And so I know that this is a problem that those of us who are concerned about changing this world are facing. Lots, there's, a, we, have a, we have some really great people out there organizing very, very wonderful and fantastic kinds of actions but we're not getting the people showing up the way we did, for example, during the Vietnam War. We felt what it was like for, for the Vietnamese to be going through what they were going through. And, and that's led to a kind of gut reaction to kind of getting out on the streets. We made that, that movement, that anti-war movement made mistakes. And one of them was to blame the soldiers for what was going on in Vietnam instead of the Pentagon and the White House. But we've gone completely the opposite direction. We've gone now to exonerating the soldiers and likewise the White House and, and the Pentagon and the military generals who are orchestrating these um, these killing fields of the Middle East. And so what I want is to, for this, exper this workshop to be very experiential, where people can really have an opportunity to experience their empathy and find where that takes them. Discover where, once you, you really start thinking about empathy, where it takes you. Because as you well know, empathy is a different way of knowing you you the facts come down differently when it comes to you through empathy yeah so um what you're wanting is kind of like an experiential kind of learning about empathy because the media is kind of like you know horror story horror story horror story and you just can't take it anymore so everybody kind of withdraws and becomes apathetic and saying it's kind of hopeless mm -hmm. it's useless but if we can kind of tap into you know, really empathizing, you know, feeling ourselves, what's going on with ourselves. And then maybe that can be some kind of an energy, uh, you know, to start building more empathy. If we can right. kind of tap into it, then we can deepen the empathy between people around us and maybe create a snowball of, of empathic connection. Exactly, exactly. And, and that snowball is what we're looking for to, to happen. What we're going to do in this workshop is, first of all, we're going to have a group to do this in. I mean, I can sit at home and be empathetic and, and try to feel what an Afghan family is feeling when their village is being mortared. But when I do that in a group, it's kind of like when you meditate in a group. It, it's exponentially uh, larger and more significant than when you do it singular, singularly. And so we have this group base for doing this. We have the, the realities of, uh, of combat and of uh, the military strikes that are going on. And in relation to the realities, I, I want to add one thing, and that is the extent to which the media is misinforming us. It's not only constantly putting gory details in front of us, but it's systematically misinforming us 
uh, another word for that would be lying about what is going on in combat with the drone strikes um, and the various U.S. incursions. We have, I'll just give you a brief example of this. About three or four weeks ago, we heard about a massacre in Afghanistan. And we heard that it was one guy, Bobby, don't remember his last name, because the, but the New York Times had headlines about our poor Bobby, who had PTSD, and with that just went off the base and went into a village and killed a lot of people. That isn't what happened. What happened is he went with 15 to 20 other men in his unit. It was a revenge killing for one of their buddies who had been shot in the leg some days earlier. And so all the rest of the world knows this. All the rest of the world has seen the news footage from the village, uh, from the people who survived it, the children of the families that were murdered, the Afghan reporter who uh, came in from Australia and, and with Hamid Karzai's blessing was able to get into the village when the U.S. Army tried to keep her out. And so there's footage, there's a lot of material. I wrote an article, other people have. The media leaves us still with the impression that this was one man kind of gone crazy. And otherwise the massacre wouldn't have happened. But the massacre would have happened because revenge is what soldiers are left with from their training to take care of their buddy in combat. And so we need to unravel these kinds of things. We need to unravel the myths about what combat is right now. There's no longer a front line, for example, in combat. It is not like World War II, where there was a line and the soldiers would go out to it and they would come back from it. The front line is the entire country of Afghanistan. The enemies are all the people in it, or potentially all the people in it. So we need to unravel the images that are being given to us in order to have a reality base for the empathy. Mm -hmm. So you're feeling that the media is really not giving the full story of what's going on, and so you can't really respond appropriately because you don't have the deeper underlying kind of essence of what's what's really happening right so if with for example with the the example that i just gave if you followed the media then what you would want to do is be sure that soldiers are being treated for ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder and we should be sure of that but that wasn't what was going on in this case in this case, if you want to take action, you got to go back to the, how these guys are trained by the military to, to cover each other's backs so that when somebody in your, your unit is shot, it's fundamentally your fault. And that's what starts to uh, invoke the revenge. So it, it's a matter of having to go through and reconstruct what really is going on now so that then we bring empathy to it, we're bringing it to the concrete reality of, of what is there. That then leads us to consciousness raising, and that's the next major section of this workshop. Mm -hmm. I think empathy itself is the very beginning of consciousness raising. We feminists in the, in the 60s and 70s had these consciousness-raising groups, and we'd get together and say, oh, this is, this is what just happened to me, and somebody else would say, that happened to me too. And then all of a sudden, you're going, oh, my God, this isn't not my lone experience. There's a pattern here. And when, once you start to see the pattern, again, you see things differently. Yeah, so it's and a matter of kind of ready. it's a matter of connecting with others because if we start feeling isolated, isolation is kind of like a non-empathic state of being. So we want to start yes. connecting with others to start seeing our common 
uh, humanity, our common experience, uh, and how others are kind of feeling similar, having similar experiences. And that's a really go ahead. Oh, and then the other thing with the military isn't the military like kind of kind of based on uh, kind of uh, training the empathy out of soldiers. I mean, that's part of learning how to kill. It's not you're not learning. You're not being trained to be a mediator. And and mediation is really about bringing people together to be uh, to, to be. Uh, use empathy to mediate problems so both sides can kind of empathize with each other. The goal is we're going to dominate you, we're going to put, you know, we're going to fight you. And uh, so it's kind of like a whole unempathic uh, kind of a structure to begin with. Well, in fact, um, even the, the, the military will tell you that it's pretty hard to get their soldiers to kill if the soldiers feel remorse. And remorse is what you feel when you're an empathetic person. When something bad has happened, and especially if you're responsible for it, you feel this very deep remorse because you can feel the hurt that, that has just been done to, that you've just done, or somebody around you has just done to another. That's pretty hard to get guys, get soldiers to kill under those circumstances. So part of the focus of military training is to drive, just as you had said very clearly, drive the empathy out of the soldiers, create conditions of remorselessness. And that's, in fact, what's then expected of us as Americans. In order to support our soldiers, mm -hmm. we have to go along with them killing without remorse. And doesn't this kind of sound a bit familiar, like the CEOs and the bankers who are running our economy into the ground from their own greed and with no sense of remorse? And the few of them that are arrested, you can see by the, the, the testimony that comes out that they have no second thoughts. No worries or concerns. Their worries might be their funding getting cut off, their bailouts being cut down, but they're not worried about the effect of the homelessness on the streets that they have caused, the hunger in this country that they've caused. So that remorselessness starts to become a, a societal condition. And it's part of the way we started talking about this, people distancing themselves, not necessarily because they're genuinely remorseless themselves, but because we live in this world of remorselessness, mm. which is in fact a kind of sociopathic world. Yeah, if we're if it's, we're if we're cutting off our empathy, kind of maybe objectifying others, it's like the enemy, they're objectified and it's okay to kill them, we have to kind of cut off our empathy to them. But if we were empathizing with them, we would be feeling how our actions are affecting them and what they're going through. We'd be feeling their pain and, and their happiness too and their full the fullness of their humanity. And right. if we start cutting off that and start objectifying them, then the soldier is kind of... Uh, you know, becoming a little bit, uh, what do you call it, more sociopathic in that sense. And then the society that's supporting the soldiers is also kind of uh, supporting those values within themselves. So it's a whole chain reaction. Yeah, th I, that's really true. And I write about this in Unmaking War, Remaking Men. How, what an effect the military is doing is, ex is requiring normal human beings who uh, have gone in to enlist or have been recruited to enlist and let's say are for the most part not sociopaths and then training them to behave as if they are sociopaths. That is not just PST, PTSD. That is a wrenching of one's humanity. And it's why the soldiers are Take, having such a hard time undoing 
what the military has done to them when they get home. Why we have the increase in soldiers, uh, in veteran suicides, um, and in violence. Yeah, so when you have that kind of beaten out of you, or worked out of you, or trained out of you, then you come back into society, and it's like hard to connect, and hard to have empathic relationships, and, and right. we, we need to have that empathic connection with others just to feel, to kind of see ourselves, to feel fulfilled, and um, and then it's leading to all those kind of problems, like you're saying, PSD yeah. and... Yeah, and and beyond that, I mean, much much deeper problems than PTSD. There's a tendency to try to make this very clinical now, and this is really a problem of the heart and the soul. Uh, and soldiers who have killed in combat, many of them will tell you that the experience of having lost their soul at the moment of killing another human being. That is not just a clinical psychological diagnosis. That's a destruction of the very humanity of another human being. Um, but going on with the workshop then, uh, we're going to go from working on constructing the reality of what's actually going on in combat, working on empathy, working with empathy, uh, and and discovering where that can take us is a different way of knowing and a new way of approaching uh, these issues. And where it does take us is into consciousness raising, experiencing that, and from there, the the the, the obvious thing is what do you do? Uh, because when, once you get to consciousness raising, you're ready to move. You're ready for action, you know. And so I think what I'm really hoping will happen is that people who are really wanting to launch projects or want to do something but don't have any idea what to do. I had lunch with a friend recently who said, the situation we're in is so bad, and I just don't know where to begin. I don't know what to do. Um, and there's ways then in this workshop that we can then take the empathy, the consciousness raising, into making change. And so we'll have a very, very full session where people will be developing um projects and plans and activities and working together, working in relation to the group that they're going back to, working in relation to something they want to initiate that hasn't happened before. All kinds of possibilities we expect to come out of this uh, for making change. And so it's even though we're dealing with a very painful and difficult subject, it's also a really, really positive environment. I mean, you know yourself, having founded and set up this center uh, for empathy that has gone worldwide, that it, it enhances your life so much to be involved in this kind of thing. Yeah, what I'm interested, it's like you're saying that uh, you have the, the uh, conscious raising, which is I've always been a little unclear what conscious raising is. I hear it a lot, but it sounds like it's um, it's where you start seeing that others have similar experiences to you, and you don't feel so alone in your and and that kind of that sense of connection. Is that the conscious raising part? I mean, is that what is is that I, sense? It, of it is the, that that begins the consciousness raising, because as you said it's pretty hard to experience empathy in isolation because you're empathetic with, empathetic for, you're not, you're not, it's not just within yourself. So yes, that kind of connection is the beginning of consciousness raising. But then you bring the knowledge of, em the, the, the empathy-based knowledge. How I see that massacre now after 
having been led to believe that it was this way, and now I see it was that way, what does that mean for me? What do I need to do to make this not be something that is continuing to happen? So it, the consciousness raising is in, in takes that knowledge, brings the knowledge that you've been developing with the empathy into your interconnection with each other that you've already been establishing through empathy. So the interconnection, and I'm really glad you brought this up, Edwin, the interconnection is the base for then being able to say, oh my God, I'm looking at this world entirely differently. This is not a World War II movie anymore. This is not going out to the front lines. These are not, these Afghans are not like the Nazis were in France and uh, in Germany uh, and through Europe during the Second World War. They are not identifiable enemies. Then how did they get to be enemies? Oh my God. What does that mean? That very question. You start throwing that question around and all kinds of new awarenesses open up. And when they do, what breaks down and diminishes is that sense of powerlessness, that sense of feeling like there's nothing I can do, and there's no way to make a difference. That diminishes and the sense of empowerment and, en and energy with that empowerment builds, and it builds with empathy. So that's what we're... Mm -hmm. You're going to take that energy and channel it into some kind of uh, action. But where does that action go to? You know, it's like, what, uh, you know, where, what do you do with that action? And I mean, there's a creative process where people are kind of brainstorming, thinking, and looking for what is the the action that we do and there's it's uh, kind of a maybe a negotiated i've seen kind of a negotiated uh kind of an action but where does it tend to go for you let let, let me give you an example back from the the women's movement back in the early days of of feminism and um, in the sixth in the 1960s and early 70s we were conf we as women and as a society, we're confronted every day, every day, with stories of women dying from butcher abortions or from self-induced abortions. When we started talking about that and started thinking about it and our concern for those women and our, that sense that that could be me, you know, the self-empathy can connected with the empathy for others immediately put us into plans of action and so we immediately started prevailing on uh, our state legislators all over the country some people started finding very good doctors who had very well qualified who were very compassionate human beings who were willing to um, provide these kinds of services to keep women away from the, what we call the back alley. And, and I'm mentioning it now because it's something we're headed back toward. You know, so it's, an, it's, an, it's a re very relevant issue right now. Um, and the, the actions became self-evident. And so there were protest marches, there were talks in high schools and talks in uh, going out and talking to community groups. Uh, there were women standing up at marches and giving testimony. This is what happened to me. This is how I almost died. Uh, allowing other people to then empathize with her. And pretty soon this was a huge nationwide movement. Uh, and in the middle of it, you know, the Supreme Court responded um, with its decision in 1973, Roe versus Wade. But that's an example mm -hmm. of how mm -hmm. empathy connects to uh, consciousness raising. And, and when you're doing that, pretty soon 
what to do becomes really evident. You know, we've got an election coming up. We've got politicians out there hoofing it around, talking about drones as if it's the most ordinary everyday thing. Sending drones to Afghanistan and we're going to, you know, go across the country in an RV. You know, it, it's as if they're all kind of on the, the same level. We can change that discourse. Mm -hmm. So we can change those policies. So with the, the women's movement, you're, you're, it sounds like you're saying that, you know, women were kind of isolated. They weren't sharing those stories. And the, there was like right. a, there's a, a narrative and they don't feel themselves reflected in the national narrative. And then they started getting together. They started sharing with each other and they started seeing their stories reflected in each other. And it's like, hey, there's this pain, there's this suffering, there's all these problems there that aren't being addressed. And then, uh, then just hearing that kind of creates a, a, a movement to address those problems. It's almost as if human beings are kind of, we're wired for problem solving. If we can kind of see, yeah. if we see what's going on, we want to, uh, you know, um, uh, work towards people's well-being and maybe it's the lgbt yeah. community as well right so you know being gay is really bad and you can't talk about it and it's kind of like repressed and so you know the lgbt community started getting together started talking and kind of this movement so that their voice and their feelings could be heard and yeah you look at that film that goes around about harvey milk you know, and you see how he goes from, um, you know, this this uh, frustration and this anger to trying to convince people. And then he gets up on the podium and he really goes after it. And people come out because he's speaking their voice. And they start, start speaking their own voice with him, you know. And, and you have the whole birth of the LGBT movement. And it's... It, it, it is the same kind of thing. And I think what we have on our side as Americans is that we tend to be pragmatic. We tend to want to find ways to, you know, address problems and, and, uh, and, and confront things. So this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness that Americans have in regard to the economy and the war right now is not our best state it's not how we usually are um and i think it doesn't it's not going to take a lot to get us there i mean it, it we have to break through the um you know the misinformation we have to reconstruct knowledge but reconstruct it with empathy yeah so it sounds and like that will, sorry go ahead Go ahead. Oh, it sounds like you're saying that empathy is kind of the way of connecting. And um, then it kind of goes into, um, you know, kind of problem solving, maybe into power dynamics. Uh, for me, it, I'm seeing that what we need is, is um, uh, Gloria Steinem. I saw a video of her, a speech she gave, and she said, empathy is the most revolutionary value, emotion. And then she said, I, you know, she felt she had, she says, Marx had it wrong. The means don't justify the ends. The means are the ends. So if, yeah. if we have empathy as the means, uh, it seems to me that empathy is also the end, too. Yeah. That we should be using empathy um, for creating more empathy in kind of a, kind of a empathic, uh, process that it's like you know not seeing people as enemies it's like the soldiers aren't the enemy the enemies aren't the enemy it's like how do we bring empathy into their lives as well and empathize with what's going on for them so that we create kind of like a, a virtuous cycle of continuously growing empathic connection that's beautifully stated and something i agree with completely and i think that as we build that, what we then do is break the bubble of this sociopathic world that we're, we're living in right now and expect that of our leaders. 
because we're not getting it from them right now. Um, but to expect this from our leaders, expect this from our military. I don't know what the military is going to do if they're expected to be empathetic, um, but it'll be wonderful to watch it. Well, maybe we um, could uh, transform the military into a core of mediators, right? I mean, mediators exactly. are, they go out and they say, okay, you've got a problem. We're here to sit down and, you know, create an environment, a, a process to dialogue about this and for you right. to solve their problems. We'll help model it or, and we'll, we will be it too. So you can see how it goes out instead of trying to, you know, tell people what to do. Yeah, and, and that's where I think an empathetic approach is very different than what we saw um, in the 60s and 70s with some of the movements going on. I, I don't think this is so true of the women's movement, but of other movements where the idea was, and this is a very Marxist idea, we know what's wrong, and if you don't, it's because you have false consciousness. And so then the, there's a kind of guilt tripping, there's an attack, and I think one of the things that keeps people shying away from being active is not wanting to enter into that arena again. And this is a different world. You don't get that kind of approach from Code Pink. You don't get that kind of approach from World Can't Wait. There's really some incredibly important organizations out there doing very, very good work. And, and they're not reinvoking that old kind of um, guilt tripping, false consciousness, berating people uh, for not being on the right side and, and that kind of thing. Um, and maybe so, judgment, yeah, think, too, is a big one. Oh, yeah huge amount of judgment going on huge it just and then it becomes like a savior kind of thing it turns marxism and those kind of politics turns into another kind of religion you know you believe the way we believe and then we're saved and you're saved and we'll save the world what we want is to be able to allow the rest of the world to to live its own life without our incursions in it, with our support where it's welcome. Um, and again, empathy has to very much rule the day in our approach to this. Yeah, well, it sounds like a great workshop. So you're going to get people together, kind of create an environment for empathic connection. I mean, you didn't kind of go into the process, like how do you create the... Uh, connection within the well, participants. We'll leave some of that. For okay. The um, <laughs> okay. You know, we know. Because uh -huh. I, I also believe very strongly in spontaneity, and you know, I be, before doing this work, I taught for many, many years, and and I really, I really need things to be able to be spontaneous for to see who's there, what they're bringing to it, how we're going to work with it, how it's going to work with what I've got in mind. And uh, in that sense, each workshop I do should be different uh, because different people will be there, different dynamics will be in play. But they'll all have these, these core elements mm -hmm. of you know, reshaping knowledge through empathy, consciousness raising, and then developing plans of action. So when you uh, do your workshops, you actually empathize with who the people are and create the workshops kind of out of an empathic connection with who's there. Yeah, I don't think, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't teach or lead a workshop without doing it that way. Um, because other, then you're just talking at people, you know, and they take notes. It, that was used to be the kiss of death to me when I was teaching was when the students would take out their notebooks to write down something because it meant that they weren't getting it in their heads and their hearts. They weren't internalizing it, you know. Um, maybe after they've figured it all out, yeah, that's the time to write something down. But 
that's what I really aim for is, you know, working with it and, and, and connecting. So would you go? So How we oh. do it is, Sorry. Well, I, just back to what you said, you, you're quoting Gloria Steinem. The means is the end. How we do it is how it will be. Would you go so far as to say that your workshop uh, is building, contributing to building a culture of empathy? Oh, I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope so. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think my book does that also. Um, and a very, very difficult subject of war, you know, it just... If we're talking about, I know that there's a lot of really good projects on empathy right now, working on um, getting children to not bully in schools and using empathy for that. That's where the seeds for for a, a bullying kind of behavior of soldiers is born. You know, is in that those. The, those actions in the schools. So this culture of empathy that you're working on from children all the way through adulthood is is very much a part of redesigning our world. Well, that's great. Um, we do. So, yeah, I think we, did we kind of go through it. Is there any kind of final um, thoughts or to close? No, I just, I just I, let me just say that this... Um, this workshop is being sponsored by the National Peace Academy, and uh, going to their website, one can um, find out more information and register, that kind of thing. Uh, next week on June, I think it's June 24th, it's next Thursday, um, I'm going to be doing a teleconference for the National Peace Academy. And uh, maybe it's the 27th. The 24th is a Sunday. So uh, June 27th, I'll be doing a teleconference with the National Peace Academy on some of the issues that will lead up to what we're going to be addressing in the workshop. So people might want to check in on that also if, it is, if there's still time to do it. Yeah. It's free. Teleconference is free. Oh, great. They just need to register for it. And and like I, I've, I've shown your website, uh, KathleenBerry.net, and I was showing it on the screen here so people could see the URL. Okay. As well Thank as, you. Uh, you know, down here there's uh, in uh, YouTube, there's a kind of a comment section. So there'll be a link to the web page I have uh, on you and links to your website. And then the previous interview I did with you and the talk you gave at Book Passage as well, so people can get in contact oh, with you. That's really great, Edwin. Thank you so much. You are such a generous soul. Well, thank you for saying that. And uh, we will be in contact then. So thank you. Well, thanks for uh, having shared the, this outline with us. Thank you. It was, it was really nice talking with you. Good talking to bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other.